Welcome to the latest episode of the Catalyst Health, Wellness, and Performance Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Bradford Cooper, and today's episode will inspire you and encourage us all to consider the untapped potential that we have within us. Our guest is Earl Fee, the holder of the 90-year-old age group world record for the 800 meters. That's a distance of about a half mile that he ran in 334. It's about a seven minute per mile pace. Most likely, the majority of our listeners can't hold that pace regardless of age. Mr. Fee, as I mentioned before, he's 90. He's the author of five books, including How to Be a Champion from 9 to 90 and 100 Years Young, The Natural Way. He has set a total of 60, 60 Masters World's records, ranging from age 57 to his current 90 at the time of this recording. And he's planning to set the mile world record for 90 plus this year. If you're currently a coach or are planning on heading that way in your career, we have a number of complimentary resources available for you on our website, which is catalystcoachinginstitute.com. From continuing education to special reports, information on our annual coaching retreat, MBHWC approved coaching certifications, and much more, you can find it all there. Of course, always, don't even hesitate. Reach out to us anytime, results at catalystcoachinginstitute.com. We can set up some time to discuss anything that's coaching related, your career, where it all fits together, etc. And you can pop over to the YouTube coaching channel, which is literally youtube.com slash coaching channel, and find a growing library of freely available video resources there as well. Now it's time to listen in on the secrets of success with 90-year-old world record holder Earl Fee on this latest episode of the Catalyst Health, Wellness, and Performance Coaching Podcast. It is my pleasure to welcome Earl Fee joining us today on the podcast. Earl, thanks for coming. Well, it's a, a pleasure to uh, participate. I've heard good things about your program, so I'm, I feel that I'm very fortunate to, to be I, interviewed. Yeah, I think we're going to have some fun. I, I Just for the audience, you have a whole bunch of world records. We're going to talk about some of them, but just to set the tone for the audience, folks, this guy ran a 334, 800 meter at the age of 90. My guess, just wild guess is 90% of the population can't run that fast of any age. So we're going to be talking about some of that, but let's start off. You ran in college and then you took a break for 33 years until restarting at the age of 56. What was the catalyst for getting started again? Well, the thing was, I, I started running with my, uh, my young boys. First, I would take them to the uh, running uh, club, uh, you know, train there a couple of times a week. There were like eight and nine. And then after a while, I I started going to these uh, training camps in Florida and California with them. And, and then I started training them myself. And uh, then I started running again myself. So that it was really my boys got me going. When Very then cool. they stopped, I kept going. <laughs> <laughs> got and now they can't keep up with you. <laughs> but uh, that's how I got going again. I love it. But I, I thought it. It was, I, I was really enjoying it. So I... Particularly when I started to break some records, I thought, well, this is a good hobby. You, you found your gift, absolutely. Obviously, your genetics play a role, but you're not alone in having good genetics. What do you think are some of the keys to performing as well as you are at the age of 90 when most folks are just happy to get up out of their chair? You're running a 334, 800 and yeah. multiple other world record speeds at different yeah. distances. But outside of genetics, what, what do you think it is? Okay, but I'll tell you. But but first, I, I will mention about my genetics. When my mother was 69, she looked about 43. And my grandfather was pretty amazing. He was very active up to 85 and, and uh, you know, acting like a young man. So th that helped a lot. But the thing is, I, I got very interested in longevity. Like, I have a lot of books on the subject. And, and then I started, I thought maybe I could write a book. It would help myself, you know, well... At the same time, so I, I learned a lot of few tricks. <laughs> but the main thing I, I found is it's important to to do intense exercise. Mm. The long, slow running is good, but intense intervals are better. And then uh, as I continued training, I found that my diet started improving. And I've now I've uh, I think the diet is so important. I particularly a lot of vegetables. I at dinner I have about my plate is about 85% vegetables. Interesting. And I have uh, fish or chicken, but uh, I don't eat beef. I, uh, I like it, but I think this is not, a, not really too good for you. So I think it's really the activity and the 
and a kind of vegetarian diet and avoiding sugar and well, there's a few other things. It's all in my book, it's, uh, 100 Years Young, The Natural Way. It's in, in three parts, body, mind, and spirit. Okay. Like most uh, longevity books are mainly on the body, but uh, I think the mind and the, and the spirit are very important too, you know. Well, let's jump into well, some of those. That, that that's, that's an area that we have a lot of guests come on to talk about behavior change, mental toughness, cognition, those kinds yeah. of things. So take us through a couple of those. Give us a couple of examples. That'd be great. Okay. For like, I have a very good chapter in my, my running book. My running book is called The Complete Guide to Running. It's been a quite a success, successful book. Anyway, in this running book, I have my best chapter probably is about mental training. So this is these are some of the tips. Like, for instance, when you uh, go at the start of your race, uh, you're, you're warming up, you have a lot of nerves. In the beginning, I didn't know how to get rid of these nerves. <laughs> mm-hmm. I was a nervous wreck for the first world championship. Anyway, the thing is, if you think about your, the good training you've done and, and the good uh, races you had, think about those things mainly, uh, like this before your, or even a few hours before your race. Like if you if you think energetic, you you, or if you act energetic, you you can be energetic, or if yeah. you act uh, confident, you can be confident. Absolutely, it, it really works. So some of the things uh, that, that help calm the nerves. So for you specifically on that one, let's just jump into that one for a second. Do you have a certain phrase that when you're lining up for these big races that works? And obviously everyone's a little different, but for you, have you found the phrase or the word that you like to repeat to yourself right before a race? Well, that's a good idea, actually, like uh, to have some kind of mantra when you're running. You know, like I, I used to think, well, oh, this is not this is not too fast. You know, it's, it's not, you know, you know, things like that you, you, you can repeat. I have a, something I might say before a race. I like I'm a little bit religious and uh, I might say, like, God be with me, you know. Like, OK, I think it used to help me help me to be my at my best or whatever, you know. In a short race, you you don't have time to just say that, but in a longer sure. race, you might, you know. So let's let's talk to your eight hundred here. So three thirty four world record. You're saying certain things to yourself before you start. As you come through that second lap, are there different things that you're saying to yourself? Do you do you break it down into okay, the first two hundred, I'm going to say okay, this, yeah. the next two hundred, that. Have you done any okay, of those yeah, type of things? Like my my best races are the hurdles and the four hundred and the eight hundred and and the mile or the 1500. Mm-hmm. So for the 800, I think about getting to the halfway mark and, and I, I like to be on schedule. You know, like you can read the big clock there. Sure. So you like to know that you're right on pace and at that so point. So if I'm a slow, I pick it up. You know. Okay. And uh, so I think about getting to, to that point. Then I, then I start thinking about getting to 500. And then when I get to 500, I start thinking about getting to 600 because I know when I get to 600, I'm, I'm going to pick up the pace. You know, and and this actually helps me because when you break it down, it's not as bad. You know, it's like running a long race. You you think about the next telephone pull. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So uh, it, we it, call it, that segmenting. That's a great strategy. It helps to break it down. And like, and mm-hmm. I when I run in the pool, I run in the pool, I simulate 800 meters by by the same effort in the deep end. You know, the same effort and uh, the same time. And, and so I think about about that reaching the halfway point and then reaching the 500 point and the 600 point. And then I think about picking it up. And that's what I do when I'm in the water. Like the water, running in the water is a very good exercise, I find. Like it simulates the actual race. Okay, so take us down that path a little bit. In your weekly running, how much of it is water running? How much of it is interval training? And how much of it is more traditional, more long, slow distance type things? Okay, well, the thing is I... And then at the last 10 or 15 years, I, I, I gave up the long running for, for aerobic training. You know? Okay. I, so I adopted this high-intensity interval training. You know? Yeah, great so, strategy. Uh, I, I would, uh, during the week, I would spend like uh, one day, like I would run three days a week. Okay. The track and and then the other days in the, in the water or cycling or, or the elliptical, but, but mainly running in the water. But That's then, interesting. Uh, so you're, you're at the track three times a week. Now, yeah, 
That is fascinating. And in the pool, a couple of days, and then elliptical bike, those kinds of things to supplement. Well, I might, I might take a day off, but okay. Lately, I haven't been doing that because my workouts haven't been that hard. <laughs> but uh, okay, so and in the summer, I would, I would be training for the four hundred and the eight hundred and the hurdles. So normally, the most weeks, I would like one day I would spend on sprinting, and the next, the other day would on the eight hundred. You know, I can get in shape pretty quick. I love hearing the fact that you're at the track three times a week. I have so many friends in their 40s, 50s, 60s that say, oh, I don't go to the track because I don't want to get injured. And I'm like, but you're not going to get faster. And and here you are at 90 saying you spend three days a week at the track doing your intervals. That's that's fantastic. Love that. Well, like I, I should mention on Sunday, I, I do something long, you know. What would that look like? Do, well, I used to do like a couple few miles of or longer running when I was under seventy five. I would I, I would sometimes train with the, uh, the marathon club, but okay, and, like do some maybe a couple hours of running. But anyway, sure. now I I do these interval training. But in, on on the Sunday, I would I would do some like four hundred meters repeats at, at mile pace, for instance. You know, when I was younger, I, I used to do like run on the track. And then a few hours later, I would uh, run in the water, you know. Okay. But uh, I don't do that nowadays, but I just do one-a-day workouts. But when I was like 60 or 65, I was doing like sometimes two-a-day workouts. <laughs> I love this. Okay, all you listeners out there who are saying, oh, I don't know if I can run that f- Oh, I don't know if I can run three times a week. Listen to this guy. This is awesome. Well, it's, a, it's a habit, you know. It is. Once you once you get into the habit, it's not that bad. Exactly. Exactly. It's not even not that bad. It's great. If you train with other people, I I, I don't do that lately because it's really better to be on my own, doing my own pace. And sure. You always have to show up right on, on their schedule. With, with, with me, I'm retired. I, I can go anytime. <laughs> so it's better to do it on my own. Right. You know? Right. I find if you're with other people, it it takes twice as long. Yeah. Just a a lot of talking. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so let's go back a few decades. Once you got started, so you were mid-50s when you restarted, did you see improvement just for the first year or two, or did you continue to see improvement for, you know, four, five, six, ten years as you got back into it? Okay, well, the first... The first year, I, I I tied a world record in the indoor on the, in the 400 meters. Okay. So I'd kept in good shape for those 30 years. So like I I'd, I'd been doing a lot of skiing and water okay. skiing. Okay. So you weren't coming from medicine. out of shape. I had a good coach. He 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 worked us pretty hard. If you see my book, it's called uh, Earl Fee is Running, my autobiography book. It it has the workouts in there. Oh, like interesting. Age, different age groups. And they're really tough. <laughs> I, I'm sort of amazed that we we did that. Yeah. But yeah. but that's what you can do when you're younger. You know, like you can do some amazing workouts. So walk us through that then. How how has your cha- training changed? Fifties versus sixty versus seventy versus eighties versus now. You you've talked about some of that. Less of the long run. A little bit more running in the pool. What what else have you noticed has changed over those three and a half decades? I, I was doing weight training too. A couple of times a week. Lately, I've just been training, uh, doing the weights on my at home in my own my push-ups and different things at home. And I, I feel I'm still in pretty good shape. Before I was 75, I was running with the, with this marathon club, and then I had some problem with my left calf. It was some uh, circulation problem, and I, I wasn't able to run that long. So that's when I, I had. So I was kind of forced into this high interval interval training, which I was still able to break records with that method. There's a lot to that. There's no you doubt. You can still get the endurance even though you're doing fast intervals. Mm-hmm. It was I was doing more of this high interval training and and uh, but I I kept up with the water running, but not quite as much. Well, the thing, of course, I, you slow down every year. <laughs> At my age, 80, 85, or ninety, you slow down about three percent a year, and even this is for world record holders. So you have to adapt, you know? So, so is that kind of the trend that you're seeing? Cause the, the data from 40 on is a little less than 1% a year, but once you hit 85, you've, you've basically seen about a 3%. Is that as you look at your well, own the, times? The way it works is like, I looked into this pretty extensively up to 65, it's, it's about 1% all the way, uh-huh, you know? Uh-huh. But then when you get 65, it's about, like, it could be 2%, but at 70%, it's definitely like 2%. And then 
near the end of the 80s, it's it's near 4%. Even Whitlock, my friend Whitlock. Uh-huh, Ed. Yeah. He was, he was uh, about 82 when he died, and he, he was slowing down about 4% a year, too. Well, that's what I was going to ask you. So the, the, all that data is based on general population trends. So for no, you... This, based, this is based on... Uh, on you specifically? Holders. Okay, very good, beautiful. Yeah. So how about for you specifically? So if we even take it the microscope down further, your 334, was that about 3 4% slower than it was? No, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, probably about 2% per year. Okay. But that's one reason why that's what I we're looking do these for. records, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the you're, you're is, saying I, generally it's 4%, but for you, you've been yeah. able to hold it about 2%, even at 90. Yeah. Beautiful. That's the reason why I can break these records because I'm I'm slowing down much slower than most people. Everybody else, right? And right. Uh, but the thing is, I'm doing the right things, and, and of course with the genes and, and the good diet, I have a little bit of wine every night, but <laughs> it doesn't. <laughs> Sounds work. like it's working. So come back to sleep. Any changes or suggestions with sleep? Have you adjusted that over time? Are you getting more? Are you getting less? Are you One of the trends you read about in the research is that as we get older, our sleep gets disturbed more easily. Have you found ways to overcome that? Any suggestions there for people listening? Well, one thing, I, I take uh, magnesium. Uh, magnesium helps you to sleep. You mm-hmm. Know? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and the thing is, you have to, like I try to avoid too much light, like in a couple hours before. Okay. They say that. That makes a, a difference. Idea. Yeah. And the thing, well, I don't think I have any other tips, but on the sleep. <laughs> but firstly, oh, sometimes I have a nap. Okay. But you have to do it before three o'clock. Right. Agreed. To keep you awake. And also, lately, I really start to like coffee. I didn't used to drink it because I, I thought the caffeine might, might be a problem. But I have to avoid that late at night. You should have to take that. You should take coffee before three o'clock. Yeah. Or even Otherwise, it'll keep you awake. Yeah. No, that's a good suggestion. And also, regular hours. You have to have regular hours. You know. Yeah. Consistency. Yes. Very valuable. And, uh, what about motivation and focus, Earl? You, you obviously are extremely motivated. You're very focused. You're at the track three uh, times a week. Can you talk to us a little bit about that in your own life and, and maybe tips that might help people that Maybe even if they're not runners, things yeah. that might help them stay motivated or stay focused on the things that they're wanting to. Well, the pursue. thing is, I, my motivation is the, the records. <laughs> if I see a record, I think, well, I, I should. I, I say it's feasible. <laughs> right. So you got your big so, why. And I started working on it, and, then, and I see progress, and, and that progress is motivating, you know. And I'll, I'll tell you another thing: the I get a lot of compliments, but the thing is. Uh, People say, "Oh, you shouldn't pay, pay attention to that." Like, uh, like I'm a modest person; I don't doesn't go to my head. But the, the these compliments they do help. I, I, I do admit, you know. Oh yeah, yeah, that encouragement. Like it, it, it's like Mark Twain said, well, "Like uh, a good compliment can keep me going for a week," you know. <laughs> so my motivation is the records, and uh, mainly, and I can, when I see progress, then. Uh, but you have to get in a habit, you know. You have to develop these habits you have have a goal and then you, you have these many goals to meet the big goal mm-hmm. when you're uh, succeeding at the, at the the small goals they give you motivation you know and you think oh i'm getting there that kind of thing helps so would that be your advice to somebody again maybe they're not even a runner if but they're coming to you and they're saying you are so motivated you're so focused i i can't seem to do that would would you help them break down those big goals into smaller pieces so they can see that mini progress. And then as they're doing that, they'll get momentum towards the bigger things. Yeah, that would be, I think you know, that would certainly help. You don't think about the small goals. Well, you think, Oh, I'm never going to get there. But if you can see that you're, you're slowly, you know, on the way, well, then you can, I think that it certainly gives hope and motivation. You know? Yeah, no doubt. But no uh, doubt. it also helps to have a coach, the coach will give motivation if he's a good coach. Are you still working with your coach now? No, no, I don't need it anymore. <laughs> you you got it dialed in. But you know, I tell you, sometimes I think, you know, what what happens? Is I I get too ambitious, you know, like and right. And I think, you know, if I only had a coach, he would have, he would have prevented me from doing that. Yeah. Yep. So maybe maybe a coach is still a good idea. Yeah. Yeah, but, I, uh, I hear you. 
if somebody were coming to you and they're in their pick a decade, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and they're hearing this and they come to you and they say, Earl, I want to start exercising. What, what, or I want to start running either one. What advice would you give them if they were just starting? They're 60 years old, they're 50 years old, they're 70 years old, or they're 90 years old. What, what advice would you give them? Well, one thing they 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 should they should find a coach. Okay. But the, the other thing is, if you can find some friends who are equally equal goals or, or similar goals, mm-hmm. uh, that's good. But another thing, they could read a couple of my books. <laughs> this book uh, that I have, the complete guide to running, has everything in there you need to get to so get rolling. Everything in there. There's diet. There's exercise. There's weights. There's base training. There's plyometrics. And there's a theory, theory uh, uh, in, in the mental training, whatever. Okay, good. So that would, the thing is, it, it, if you if, if you just leave it up to your coach, well, that's okay. But it's, it's even better if you if you have a good knowledge yourself, because Absolutely. the coach is not going to be watching you 100 percent of the time. <laughs> right. All right. So you've so, you've always been very goal oriented, and you've got your eye on these world records. So that's a big part of your vision. Outside of running, what what vision do you have for your life over the next year with the running aside? So other aspects of life, talk us through that a little bit. Well, I got I have a friend and he's he's he was he's a very good karaoke singer. He got me like he's a, <laughs> he's a coach, a track coach too, nice. retired and so he got me quite interested in this karaoke. And I, and I have on my computer a program I can get in any song I want. Nice. I can practice in front of the computer. I love it. I love yeah. it. That's perfect. We, we won't ask for a sample today. <laughs> no. <laughs> if I see a, t- a, a tune I like, I, I practice it about 10 times. Nice. I get it down, right? I love it. I love it. Just like going to the track, pull up that music, you're on it. Like well, I have a, a song like it's called uh, "You'll Never Find uh, Another Love Like Mine" with yeah, yeah. Lou Rose. Uh-huh. I have the voice for that. I I sound nearly nearly as good as him. You know, well, like, new career because I've I've sung it about fifty times. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. But, but then I I I sometimes take some dancing lessons, but I I find that they they could interfere with the running. I, I did hurt my ankle one time doing some steps, and uh, so I don't. In fact, I there was a Valentine's dance late lately. I I went there, I, but I didn't take my my lady friend because she normally wants to dance every dance, and uh, <laughs> and the last time I got a sore foot out of it. <laughs> oh. so there's pros and cons with, it. but I I like hiking as well. That's another good activity. Yeah. Yeah, all those supplementary things. Last question: any any final tips for the, our listeners or, or folks that are wanting to improve their own or help other people improve their health, wellness, performance? So, just as you think about your your knowledge and all the things you've learned and read and written about, any final tips that we haven't already talked about for people that are trying to improve one of those areas? Well, okay, I think the, the mental rehearsal. Oh, like if you want to run a good whatever. You rehearse it in your mind, and many times, and then so when you and you rehearse, like the stadium, even mm-hmm. sure, I know what that stadium. Picture is. it. It's mm-hmm. good if you could visit the stadium, mm-hmm. and then you you have this mental training, and it's it's nearly as good as the real thing, you know. So I I think that's a, that's a very good uh, tip. I love it. I love it. And that can be applied to anything. No, no, no that. doubt. Another thing is, most people don't practice mental training. They they should be. Yeah, spend, they don't even spend ten minutes a week on mental right. training, but they should be looking a lot into mental training. Huge opportunity. Like for instance, I'm planning to break the indoor mile in at my age group, and I've rehearsed this quite a few times each lap. What time am I going to have at that lap? You know? mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And what time am I going to have at these different laps? So when I when I get there, I'm not going to be confused. <laughs> How soon is that race, and what time are you well, shooting for? It's in two weeks. This record is not, in my opinion, is not too hard. So it's going to be close to like an eight-minute mile. Okay. Yeah, based it's on your three thirty-four, you got that. I've 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 already done this in, in training, but you never know what if I go out too fast or something like this. Sure. It could be a problem. I have to. 
pace is very important. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I often go out too quick and, and you pay for it at the end. Yeah. So you you got to be relaxed. It's very important to be relaxed. When you think of running, when you're doing your strides or whatever, think of a relaxation. You know, like think, well, I, I'm using minimum energy and this, this will help, you know. Well, and that probably applies to a lot of things that we do. When we're gritting our teeth and bearing oh, down yeah. too much on anything, maybe we're not at our best. Well, no, I mean, I was, when I was like in high school, mm-hmm. I was still pretty good, but I would tense up on the face. Mm. And nobody told me about it. <laughs> mm. But I, I used to uh, do a lot of walking. I, <laughs> I had a job and I, I walked a long way to and from, and, and this helped my running. You know? Sure, sure. And at the same time, I, I memorized my French. <laughs> that, that's a good combination, actually. I'll carry a tape player with me once in a while when I'm working on a speech or a, a new talk or a write up of some sort. And just the, it's amazing what the brain can do when you're out there moving. That's it. Well, Earl, thank you so much. Really appreciate you joining us. There's no doubt people are going to love this one. You're a huge inspiration. Good luck in that mile that's coming up and keep us updated. Well, anyway, I enjoyed talking to you. Well, I guess that's the end of our excuses, isn't it? Earl and I had been working on that interview for a full year, and it was fun to have it come together. I'm I'm sure you hear and, and maybe even use all the excuses about exercise after specific ages. It's fun to see someone who's still getting it done at a high level at 90 plus years of age. Thank you so much for tuning in to the number one podcast for health and wellness coaching. And thank you, thank you, thank you for sharing with others. Next week's episode, this is, this is gonna be an interesting one, very special episode. It features physical therapist and nationally board certified health and wellness coach, Susan Clinton. She's discussing a sensitive but very important topic, incontinence and pelvic floor dysfunction. This is an area that often stays in the background And we thought it was important to highlight the topic with our amazing listeners who may either be struggling in silence or know someone who is. Susan did a wonderful job sharing evidence-based hope during our discussion. I know you're going to enjoy it. If you've been enjoying the podcast, you might also be interested in the new YouTube coaching channel. It's little youtube.com slash coaching channel. Some recent episodes have included brief clips on fitness in our 40s, 50s, and beyond, speaking of Earl Fee revisiting your personal vision that maybe you set earlier in the year, and multiple, multiple resources if you're a current or future coach. Folks, now it's go time. Mr. Fee demonstrated so effectively that we can do so much more than we realize. Let's stop talking about it and take that step, that next step toward better than yesterday. This is Dr. Bradford Cooper signing off. Make it a great rest of your week, and I will speak with you soon on the next episode of the Catalyst Health, Wellness, and Performance Coaching Podcast.